Melissa, thank you for coming, and if you could please introduce yourself. Sure, thanks for having me, Robin. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Melissa Anderson, and I am an HR business partner with Schneider Electric. We are a, a Fortune 500 global organization um, focusing in energy management. So we have locations in over 140 countries and uh, just over 120,000 employees worldwide. Wow, that's quite the organization. Yes, it is. And so Melissa, in your role as a partner, can you tell us more about what you do? For sure. So my roles have varied in, over the past few years. Um, I've held both local and global HR business partner roles. Um, today I'm focused on the Victoria location, so I oversee about 400 employees and support about 70 different managers, and that's for all facets of HR. My goodness, that is global indeed. And so Melissa, in this course we're talking about international human resource management, and I'm very excited to hear your experiences as a woman, as a young woman who's traveled overseas in a professional role, where certainly here in Victoria you hold lots of power and authority. Tell us a bit about those experiences, something that's happened to you. Sure. So in 2009, I was promoted into a global HR business partner role. And that included responsibilities for about 250 people um, across five countries. So Canada, US, France, India, and China. So within the first week, they brought together the leadership team for the new business. Um, there was about 13 of us, including the other vice presidents and uh, there was only two women there. So there was the assistant and myself. So there I am with a new business, a new leadership team, and I am the only woman and probably by far the youngest member of the leadership team. So it was a great uh, week to kick off for us to identify some of our strategies, uh, challenges, what the organization was gonna look, for, look like, uh, and sort of our first 90 days of setting up the new business. Wow. And uh, so tell us about being in a different culture. Which, which country was this in particular? Sure. Yeah, so my first trip and experience was in France. Okay. And um, the culture is very, very different. Um, you know, we walked in and, and right away, uh, one of the assistants who I'd spoken with on the phone before came over and, and kissed me on the cheek. <sighs> Okay. Right? So again, first walking in the door, something very different than what we're used to in North American business culture. Um, also the work cultures are different in many ways, one being the days are very long. So we would start our meetings probably around 8 a.m. and we wouldn't finish our meetings often until 7, 7.30 p.m. And then everybody goes for dinner, you know, so you're having dinner at 8.30, 9 o'clock. Um, and then you get back to the hotel and, and do your email uh, for, the, for the day. So, you know, um, that is some sights into the organizational work cultures that are different. Um, but certainly even just when we go out for dinner, um, you know, the people speak a different language. Right. They speak French. Yes. So I relied a lot on my French colleagues to help me order my dinner, mm -hmm. uh, to help make sure I got in the taxi and got back to the hotel okay. Um, so those were some of the differences that I saw right away. So when you went to bed that first night, your head is reeling with some of these experiences. Tell us a bit about that. How were you putting all this together for you from Canada, from Victoria? Sure, so there was a lot of pressure there has been a lot of pressure put on, I think, HR professionals in the past few years to be strategic. And I think in this new role, I went in as the global HR business leader, and the vice president stood up at the beginning of the meeting and said, Melissa is our HR decision maker, period. So he, he gave me a lot of authority in that first meeting, which was great, but incredibly terrifying, <laughs> um, knowing that I was now overseeing uh, you know, a number of people in different countries that I had never traveled to, I had never met them, different processes, different systems, different cultures, um, so a lot to learn. So lots to do and I probably only got about four hours sleep that night. I'll bet. And so I want to ask you a question about being female and what that was like. Did you feel the respect and authority uh, in your role? Uh, did people push back against that? What was it like being around men from other cultures? You as a young female from Canada. Tell us more about all that. Sure. So I think in some ways 
I'm very fortunate to work for an organization like Schneider Electric. Uh, gender balance and diversity was put on our CEO's sort of top five initiatives about mm -hmm. two and three years ago. Wow. So he started really driving the message that we needed to work on it mm -hmm. uh, and work towards it. Mm -hmm. And by no means, I don't think we've perfected it. Um, I, you know, we have metrics each year we try and achieve and to hire more women and to support women more. Mm -hmm. But I think that helps. So going into to the different countries that I've been into, I haven't felt a ton of pushback or disrespect. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, in some ways, I think I felt more respected going into some of the other countries because they take a lot of pride in what they do, mm -hmm. um, the types of products and, and business that they deliver, um, and they've always really treated us like guests. Mm. So I've been very lucky. I mean, of course, we put our own pressures on ourselves um, to make sure that we can uphold a certain level of authority, but uh, overall very lucky. Very good. And, um, and so now, Melissa, just turning the corner a little bit, the countries that you've been to have been the United States and France yes. primarily, and the colleagues that you've had of, with you have been colleagues from all over the world. So tell us about some of your colleague experiences yeah. in the same HR role, uh, having some authority, wanting to do strategic change in their jobs when they travel. What's that like for them? For sure. I think strategic okay. change is obviously core to any senior leader's, senior leader's role. Um, and some of the challenges that we've faced globally, so looking to uh, make changes in any of the countries I've talked about, is the different cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, my colleagues and I talk about this a lot, along with our business leaders. You have to understand that there's differences in communication styles. Um, there's differences in cultures. So, for example, in India, it's very much a relationship-based culture. Mm -hmm. And so, as when we, we actually acquired an organization there a few years ago, and we had to do a ton of learning about how to go in and make changes without disrupting the business that we had there that was incredibly successful. So, I think understanding the different communications, understanding the different cultures, and being open to understanding how they do things and why they do things that way before we go in there has been key. So in India, what do they do within the context of their culture that made it successful? Sure, so the organization that, that we acquired was actually ran by a husband and wife. So really captures the essence of India, which is a relationship-based, uh, very much around traditions, uh, family values. So they spent a lot of time uh, being close with their employees, um, knowing their customers, um, having the employees' families come on site for different types of events and, and things like that. Uh, really a family feel. So as you can imagine when you're acquired by a Fortune 500, that is a much different feel, mm -hmm. can be, um, and so that brought with it a lot of fear. So we very quickly um, put in charge one leader who could sort of play that leadership role to make sure that they were continuing to still feel some of that um, harmony that they really look for in that country. So with the Fortune 500, that sort of ominous corporate role coming in, tell us about that different feel. What might that have felt like for people from India to have a Fortune 500 come? What would they be afraid of? For sure. So I think um, our teams in India and even our teams locally have, have felt this. When you have a global organization um, that doubled their size in five years, that's how Shinano Electric grew. A lot of it was through acquisition. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, we had a ton of different organizations all over the place that had different processes, different systems, different uh, channels to market, mm -hmm. different branding, different marketing. So sooner or later, you know, our CEO realized, wow, we better harmonize these or else we're not telling a consistent story to our end user customer. Mm -hmm. So what India felt, and, and, and we did as well, was that there's a lot of harmonization going on, which a lot of times makes sense at the global level, but the impact at the individual site level can feel like maybe you're losing out, mm -hmm. or you have to give up maybe some pride if, if, for instance, they produced a product in one way very well and it had been successful and now we're telling them to do it slightly different because it aligns with a global standard. Uh, that is some significant change management. 
And so how would a Fortune 500 then, when you're thinking about even HR practices, how would those be regarded when standardization would be important, but you don't want to just harmonize and have that country lose its appeal, its, its individuality? How does that work? Thinking about it at the HR level. Sure. HR practices even. Yeah. Um, this is something that uh, we started within the organization in 2009 and uh, we called it HR transformation and it was really as the company was becoming one company we needed HR to also become one HR and so the philosophy of our executive vice president of HR uh, was that we have global practices programs initiatives but that they are ad adopted locally so of course sometimes as we know as HR professionals there are uh, statutory or, or legal requirements within different provinces, states, and countries that we have to abide by, mm -hmm. but also to ensure she gave us the flexibility in country to specialize on, based on the local adaptations needed for our culture, mm -hmm. for our employees, you know, for the different challenges that we were facing. So when it would come to health and safety, how does that work? Sure. Do you bring Victoria standards or do you go with a different country's regulation? What do you do? So health and safety is a key priority mm -hmm. within the organization because a lot of our um, sites have manufacturing sites, mm -hmm. but also a lot of our products are out in the field and can affect our customers' health and safety. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, so we have North American, so for instance, North America, we have North American team, mm -hmm. safety team, and they set standards uh, that they see fit for the North American area, mm -hmm. but then to each plant, they can modify depending on maybe the local BC workplace health and safety laws um, or depending what specific equipment or types of roles are, are produced, are, are completed in our, in our plant. Mm. Okay, thank you. Now when you go back to thinking of going to France or even United States, different parts of the United States certainly have different cultures than we have uh, on the west coast of BC. What would be, putting on your HR hat now, you're there on HR business, what would be your um, best experience, would you say? What just made you sing and dance? I think some of the best experience I ha I've seen and I've had, uh, I was working on a, a global HR program and we had people in the room uh, from, from France, uh, from India, uh, myself from Canada and several from the U.S. and I think the value that I see and what gets me energized is the diversity mm. in a room and just the output that can come from that mm -hmm. because the different ideas, the different experiences, the different education mm. um, that can come together is is just profound. I mean it, it, what we what we delivered was so much greater than, than I could have done just on my own, mm -hmm. sitting on Vancouver Island, trying to create a global HR program. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. So many heads together. Exactly. And when I'm thinking about you traveling around the world or your colleagues in other countries traveling to different countries, what does Schneider do to prepare you, to prepare others, to prepare families for these moves? Do they have a program? Uh, are there things to be learned for Schneider over time? around how to get you ready to go somewhere else. Yeah, so we have a lot of international travelers mm -hmm. and I think we can still do better, um, <laughs> for sure. I think a lot of people learn by talking with their colleagues. Okay. So I'm going to China next week, you know, what are the top three do's and don'ts? Mm -hmm. um, because again, when you're going into, especially some of the Asian cultures, uh, there are some traditions uh, that you really need to be sensitive to. Um, we do have e-learnings uh, that people can take. We offer uh, cross-cultural training uh, for our staff. Um, from a safety perspective, we have an international organization that provides us with reports yeah. on all of the countries. So if there is some sort of political or other sort of unsafe uh, situation, uh, certain countries are flagged. Um, and depending on the flag level, if it's red or yellow, uh, either travel is prohibited for the safety of our employees, um, or if it is maybe yellow, then it requires like a VP approval to, to entry that country. We all have uh, emergency um, 
what we call SOS cards. So if something does happen or there's a strike or there's an earthquake and we feel like we need to be evacuated, uh, we can call this number and they help to get us out of the country as quickly as possible. And so if you were invited to go to a country with a yellow and you went home that night and said, I'm nervous about this, can you choose not to go? How does that work? Yeah, I think, I think it's always to the employee's choice, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it is certainly something that Schneider tries to be very sensitive to. Um, we have an incredibly flexible workplace because of the global nature of our business. And what I mean about that is there is always somebody, you will receive emails from 6 a.m to 6 a.m. It never stops because there's always an office open. So a lot of times our employees are on the phone either at 6 a.m. and it can be as late as 11 p.m. You know, I have a call coming up at uh, 4 a.m. because it's the only time that works to get France, Hong Kong, you know, the U.S. and Canada on the phone. So I think when it comes to things like traveling, if someone was to feel um, insecure, it wouldn't be forced. Mm -hmm. We have also invested a lot of money in video conferencing for a lot of our major locations. So we're really starting to use that more and more. A good tool for communicating. Absolutely. Tell us a bit about cultural sensitivity and dress and uh, your experience or your colleagues experience. How do you know what to wear? What offends? What doesn't? Yeah. Well, um, again, talking to people that have already gone. Um, a lot of people do some research on their own if they're going to a new country. Um, certainly, we always have sort of a, if you're going for a group of meetings, let's say, there's typically a local facilitator. So often, too, they'll send us just some short, short notes on what the um, practices are within that location as far as dress, meeting times, you know, food, what we can expect. Mm -hmm. um, so overall, you know, we know that going into Europe, it's typically uh, more fancy. Uh, they have uh, very nice uh, fashion and style there. So most of us dress up, in fact, when we go into Europe. And then into areas in Asia, it's typically more reserved just because of some of the traditions. Oh, so you have a whole new wardrobe too. Yes. That's yes. very nice, the perk of the job. One of my managers <laughs> jokes that she's got her outside Victoria suitcase <laughs> in, her, in her closet. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, a few minutes ago you talked about going to China and you thought about the three things that you have to know to do and the three things that would be negative to do. Yeah. Can you point any of those out to us? What would they be? What jumps out? Sure. So I think just speaking about um, travel internationally in general, um, we, you need to be aware of the surroundings, so the infrastructure, mm -hmm. especially being a woman. Mm -hmm. So going into somewhere like Paris, or going into a major city in China, the infrastructure is quite developed. And what I mean by that is, even not being a French speaker, it's, we can feel pretty comfortable knowing that we're gonna be able to figure out our way, get around from the office to the hotel, either public transport or taxi. Um, but what I've heard from my colleagues is you go into somewhere like India, the infrastructure is less developed and it's much more chaotic. So in that case, in fact, we actually have a driver on staff in India. Uh, and my colleague who was just recently in India, you know, I said, how did it go? She said, you know, great trip, but she was not comfortable um, going anywhere without the driver or with uh, another male companion um, outside, of, outside of the office. Mm -hmm. So certainly, you know, knowing what you're going into. Um, secondly, being aware of the traditions. Um, so for instance, in China, uh, people typically will present a business card in a certain way and, and you're supposed to hold it and receive it in a certain way. Um, same as in France, for example, it's common culture to, at lunchtime, go and eat with your whole team or with the people you're meeting with, which is a real difference from North America. A lot of us sit at our desk, maybe go for a run on our own, run some errands, you know, it's busy, 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 where over there we had to learn. If you don't go for lunch, to the cafeteria, you can be seen as a little bit of an outsider or not really participating in the culture. Oh my, that yeah. is interesting. So that leads me into uh, one of my last questions, which would be, tell me about a communication mix-up, if there has been one that just sticks out for you as, oh my gosh. Sure. Well, on my first trip to France, when I mentioned I took the new role, I went over there, we had a few days of meetings, and then I had a, a few days free, so I wanted to meet with everyone who is sort of our top talent, let's say. P 
people that had been identified as key talent within the organization because I had never met them before. So I set up one-to-one uh, -one meetings with each of them thinking, very nice, I'm going to go in, say hi, under try and understand what their career development has been so far, what they'd like it to be, uh, challenges they see within the current organization, where we're trying to go, just a meet and greet, you know, something we do quite often in North America. Well, what I didn't realize until about three in is that is very uncommon in France. So typically in France, HR had been sort of a little bit more removed, uh, again going to maybe more of a hierarchy. Uh, in France, the HR is not as open, um, you don't typically just stop by their door, open door policy. So I think they were all quite fearful. What I realized is they were actually all quite fearful that all of a sudden this HR, new HR person from Canada is calling them for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. So again, had I known, I probably should have set a little bit more context up ahead so that they weren't so nervous. Mm -hmm. So then when, after the first few, as soon as they came in, I said, okay, let me just introduce why I'm here mm -hmm. um, and what this meeting is all about to try and put them at ease. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of communication that we take for granted. Yes. So Melissa, is there anything that this class that you would want them to know, our Business 421 Strategic HR, as it comes to international business, what should they know? Your sort of parting thoughts. Sure. I think the most important thing is to understand that sometimes just doing the basics right mm -hmm. is your key lever to success. I, I just reread uh, this week um, my thesis from 2009, which was on uh, best practices in global teams. Mm -hmm. And I had identified a set of recommendations, better communication, uh, setting up teams properly. So that what I mean by that is when you have a project team, make sure they get to know each other. Mm -hmm. They understand each other, strengths, development areas, everything. Um, ensuring that there's time for the team to work on team stuff. Make sure there's clear priorities and objectives. So stuff that after a little while in business you think is pretty basic, mm -hmm. But I can tell you today, we still don't do it right 100% of the time. Yeah. So to really just focus on setting up a foundation in teams and in organizations mm -hmm. is really key, key to future success. Those are great reminders. Mm -hmm. And you're right, we're so busy skipping over the top, we forget to dig down That's deep. Right. Okay, well thank you very much, Melissa Anderson. Thank you for coming to see us and for taking the time. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you for having me.